Great, Sarah, you're here. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, Ricardo. Yeah, let me introduce you and I will start right away. So, so today in our series of expeditions in experiential AI, we have the pleasure to, to host uh, Sarah Ostadavas. She's an assistant professor in the electrical and computer engineering department of Northeastern University. Uh, she has been uh, more than five years uh, in, with us and she's the director of the Augmented Cognition Laboratory uh, at the university. Um, today, most, most companies have small data. Most companies in the world will never have big data in spite of the big, big data hype. So I think that today's topic is really important because uh, Sarah will tell us how to use small data to learn very strong inference models. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ricardo and the Institute for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk about uh, this topic on how we, uh, we learn a strong inference model, which means learning uh, accurate as well as robust uh, machine learning algorithms uh, when we have the problem of data shortage. I am Sarah Astadabas, an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at Northeastern University. In short, um, uh, uh, by the way, this talk is the continuation and expansion of my uh, talk last week, which was uh, very short uh, during the lightning talk of the inaugural event for our institute. Uh, so in short, my area of research is at the intersection of computer vision and machine learning with a special focus on representation learning in visual perception problem. Uh, the visual perception problems, if um, you, you haven't heard about them, they're just simply the class of problems that work with processing and analyzing video and images. On the applied side of my research, um, uh, my, uh, my work has been primarily contributing to detecting, understanding, and predicting human and animal behaviors uh, by estimating the physical, physiological, and emotional states. So to have a robust and efficient state estimation, uh, the, algorithm that, uh, uh, the algorithms that uh, we are developing in my lab uh, represent the state of the world that's coming from the video and images in a low dimensional embedding called pose, which is a succinct as well as a very much interpretable um, uh, representation of the important information in the state. So as you can imagine, I'm doing a lot of pose estimation problem here. You, you see some examples of the active project in the lab. Uh, for example, here you see when we are applying body poses to, to um, uh, um, understand uh, patient behavior, especially Parkinson patient behavior after uh, receiving uh, diagnosis and also treatment. This is a collaboration with the Pfizer uh, medical imaging uh, branch. Uh, here, it shows the a very interesting um, application of in-bed or an in-crib uh, pose estimation. The, uh, when we come the human pose estimation inside the bed and during the sleep, uh, uh, sleeping hours, this problem uh, um, encounter a lot of uh, adverse vision uh, situation. You are, you are not sleeping the blood um, bright light. So the low illumination or no light also being covered all of the challenges that we have to address in this pose estimation problem. Uh, in the middle, you see how we use for toddler or infant pose estimation and how well, that is important in uh, to, uh, to track specific de developmental milestone. This is going to be the focus of uh, this talk. So I'm not going to go to the details here. Uh, aside from body, also facial poses are important for infant developmental um, tracking. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to human, not only body and faces are important for pose, pose estimation. I have been using this low dimensional embedding extract, uh, extraction in, uh, an, uh, in a collaborative uh, project with uh, both psychology and, uh, and computer science department at Northeastern to understand the low dimensional embedding of the uh, functional ML, um, MRI, fMRI. And that helped us to understand the, the experience, uh, experience of uh, different people under different stimuli. When we come outside of human, for, for this, uh, specifically when we are studying animal in cage, understanding their poses and then which can lead to understanding their behavior can be uh, used as a model for uh, drug um, discovery, behavioral stimulation 
uh, studies and so on and so forth without before going to the to the uh, human subject and this one um, uh, last not least the, the project is the, the, the project in understanding um, the pose of flying bat uh, can help uh, us especially my collaborator in robotic to uh, to design a very nat uh, natural behaving uh, flying drone uh, let me have a disclaimer here. You see a lot of uh, a project here that have very strong multidisciplinary uh, component. So um, I want to here say that I am I'm not not roboticist, neither a physician here. So I have to work with them uh, closely with the other discipline to be able to on the problem formulation and uh, as well as making the solution work for them. And this is actually one of the, the model we are uh, pursuing in the Institute for Experiential AI. So aside from pose, uh, pose estimation, of, as, as you see here, I'm also doing a lot of reposing. So from one image, um, you, if you give me one image from yourself or, or anybody else, we can make them actually dynamic. This allows us to expand the data set that we, that we have. Not only that, since pose happen in 3D, uh, recently we have been also working on making the repo reposing in the 3D, so for both animal and human. So this allows us, again, expansion of the data set. Remember, all these, these three, uh, these many um, application, they could um, very well uh, <coughs> dealing with the data shortage. So um, as I mentioned, even during the inaugural event, when we when it comes to the pose estimation, especially these, these advanced and very, uh, very uh, complex pose estimation model, they need data, a lot of data. However, the application that I'm focusing on, this the specific application on understanding, detecting, and predicting human or animal behaviors, they are dealing with the data shortage. This, this domain, <clears throat> I have been calling that a small data um, domain. Let me actually put that, put the, the small data domain in context. We heard, uh, during uh, the uh, inaugural event, also the, the the concept of a small data, which came in in that context, uh, only in the the idea behind personalized data. However, in the last five years, I've noticed I have been using this this concept much uh, broader. Uh, let me give you an example. When uh, when the the big data era started. Uh, the, the day that they started calling them big data was the day that classical machine learning weren't able to, to support or process that data. So we were calling them uh, big data. So for to address big data, that the solution to that from the machine learning and, uh, and AI community was having advanced um, machine learning approaches, advanced machine learning techniques, including deep learning. Now, when it comes to small data, uh, or the amount of data or the, the problem domains where the advanced machine learning cannot work because of the data sh shortage. So it's much broader than only being a personalized data. So anywhere that we want to apply advanced machine learning and we don't have enough data to make the model work, uh, I have been calling that a small data domain. And the solution in very <laughs> brief can be written in one uh, sentence. To, to address that, I have been combining two types of approaches. First, I start generating the data. You are, are already saw that the reposing of one, one image can help us in 2D or 3D expand the data set. And that is done by, by adding explicit knowledge inside the generative models. And then also benefiting from the, the advanced machine learning, for, which they are also data efficient. There are different approaches that you can make that your model, although it's still very much complex, but work with the less amount of data. Let me also, I have received, especially after that talk, a lot of email and also question about that, this is a small data problem. The small data problem, um, unlike its name, is not a small problem. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the breakthrough of the AI in the last uh, decade, you see every major breakthrough happens when we have very big amount of data become available. And this is an enabled by the, the way that they are gathering and labeling data. The uh, Google images out there, so it has a lot of data. This Google images allows us to have the, the image net. Then the labeling of that also very important. We have uh, now system that 
uh, organize human to, to label massive amount of data. And you know, one of them is like uh, mTORC, Ma Ma Amazon Mechanical Torque. And here I want to claim that to hit the next big leap in the, uh, in the machine learning and AI, we need much more label data. So it means that whatever uh, problem that you have in hand and, uh, and whatever amount of data that you have, that problem can be called a still a small data problem because if you want to go to the next level of the, the accuracy, next level of performance, you need much more data. And if you think about that, the solution is, first of all, somehow we need to find a way to uh, automatically do the data gathering because we are already reaching the capacity of the human to go and, and collect the data. Uh, and also automatic labeling. I mean, this um, AWS, we are actually uh, getting as much as possible from the, um, not AWS, sorry, the, uh, the mTORC, uh, Amazon Mechanical Tour. So we need to find uh, a way to automate this. And this is the, the, uh, the, uh, the area that uh, my research try to contribute. And that is the, the contribution by making as I say, I'm, I'm repeating that because that's the, the main um, contribution of the, uh, my work in the last five years by making somehow generating the data using generative model and also making sure that the amount of the uh, label data that we need is, is, uh, not, uh, um, is not a problem. So uh, let me go and start, uh, give an example on a very interesting a small data problem, infant pose estimation. So you saw that uh, I have been working on the infant in the crib, infant uh, doing a specific activity and also infant facial expression. So it turns out the, uh, the uh, motor um, development, which happens prior to the any social and communication skill development uh, happened from very early on from the time that the infants are born. And the disruption in this motor devel development and hitting the milestone here, you see that different milestone that, for example, uh, crawling should happen exactly in the specific time uh, period as well as sitting. So disruption can be the host of many uh, developmental disorder, uh, such as uh, cerebral palsy, autism spectrum, and so on and so forth. So if we have a way to can, uh, that we can um, uh, long term continuously and uh, easily unobtrusively monitor this motor development, we can actually find this um, uh, this um, disruption earlier and provide the uh, the uh, the intervention in a timely manner right before it's too late. However, um, I mean a lot of uh, parents they already have baby monitors, so. The visual perception is there. The means of video is there. The, uh, it's very prevalent, but uh, assessing those amount of data is very hard. And um, the the problem can come to how we can actually assess these these uh, uh, data that is uh, collected by baby monitors or other other video um, recording system. Uh, the the first as uh, as an AI. <laughs> uh, um, person, uh, the first um, solution is just why not using this very, uh, very uh, well-performed uh, human pose detection model that uh, in the last um, five, six years have been very successful in not only detecting uh, human poses, but also um, estimating the shapes around them. However, uh, the problem comes from the, uh, the, the fact that this model trained on the, uh, for general purpose human, mostly adult, and then they don't uh, transfer well when it applied on um, infants. So here is an example. We applied the state of the art uh, open pose, the latest version of open pose on the infant in the crib. And uh, for um, a specific frame, it works, but then you see the specific types of uh, um, position that infant takes is not, it's completely now it doesn't work. One other thing is come um, from the also the the, um, the point of view and the angle of the camera. We cannot have a, a drone on the top of the, the crib until that we do to to follow the infants. So we have to have some uh, something that works with different camera angle, the specific um, uh, vision condition, um, low light, no light, uh, night vision, and also work with the with the infant specific stru structure. 
we wanted to look at the what are the challenges why this model uh, break down and that is a good practice to rather than just saying okay it doesn't work we look at the underlying issue that, that that's going to help us to then uh, start addressing those issues hopefully one by one one thing that we realize is the types of activity and poses that um, the infants uh, take versus adults or even uh, children so the, the types of um, uh, poses are very different they are poses that the machine hasn't seen in the very larger state data set and that th this means that the, the model then cannot uh, detect those specific poses when it comes when we are applying on infants but it wasn't only uh, this is not the only um, challenge here the other challenge is the this shape of the infants um, compared to the shape of adults and the, the most bone to muscle ratio. Infant has different um, bone to muscle ratio. This means that the model, the 3D model, for example, trained on adults, is not going to fit on infants. So not only we have the problem of pose estimation, but also shape estimation. So put, we have a problem in both 2D and 3D. To put it uh, in, the, uh, in the more um, quantified way, we were actually looking at the, this um, uh, feature gap, uh, feature distribution gap between the, the two data set. The, uh, on the uh, um, left um, uh, bottom corner, you see the, uh, the adult data set from um, uh, Microsoft uh, Coco large scale um, adult data set. And the upper right, you see the infant data set, uh, which is the only publicly available infant data set that we collected. It was just very, I'm going to talk about that. It wasn't a trivial task to collect that, that data. And then we showed the feature distribution. So the cap, gap is very obvious. There you see that in, in the middle, there are some, some uh, overlap, but overall there is a huge gap. Uh, and uh, this, this is a um, TSNE uh, distribution, or imagine it's a nonlinear PCA principal component analysis type. So we, just, we, we have the huge, um, um, high dimensional um, feature space, or imagine even the, uh, the, uh, uh, the pixel of the image to project it to this low dimensional um, setting. And uh, we were visualizing that to see if they are, if there is a domain gap and it shows. And that is the reason the model, they don't work well on when, when, it's, uh, when they are applied on, on infant images. So the small data challenge also, this, here is very uh, pronounced. The, the idea, if somebody said, so this model works, so apply it from scratch, why are you even applying the one that is trained on the, on the adult data set? Why don't you apply that on the infant one? Why don't you collect enough data? If, uh, the um, MS Coco, the uh, Max Planck Institute has at least larger scale, their 3D human data set available. Why don't we have the same thing for infants and the problem solved? The problem then, there is, there is two, this, this challenge comes uh, from uh, twofold. One is, uh, first of all, there is nothing out there that you can go ahead and, and take the data from. So there is no social media for infants or it's very restricted. Uh, they are, there is no movies that they, they feature infants uh, that much that we can, we can actually use, use that. There are some data sets in the clinical setting that we don't have access to. We don't have IRB to, to, to get uh, access to. And the another um, uh, problem, it comes to, the, especially when it comes to collecting data and asking infants come to the uh, lab setting, they are not a uh, cooperative individual. So you cannot ask them like uh, put a bunch of um, uh, uh, motion capture sensor on them and ask them to do a specific uh, poses for us to, be, to make sure that we have diversity in our, our data set. So this means that rather than having uh, several um, uh, thousands of data or millions of instances of motion capture data, we don't have anything in hand. So how do uh, to address the problem? Again, let's get back. We have to, to have enough data uh, to be able to, to train a model or even, or even fine tune the model to have enough, more because it's a, uh, the, the models are complex enough that they need some data. And then we have to, to, to generate that data or find that data somehow. And then the second step is, is still whatever we are doing that is not going to be enough. It's not going to be in the million range. Uh, we have to make use of the, the advanced but data efficient um, machine learning. So we have here, I, I'm going to talk to you how we, we step by step went through this, this uh, process by making our own, uh, our own data set 
and then also making a fine-tuned domain adapted um, very data efficient uh, pose estimation network specifically for infants. So the synthetic and real infant pose data set or in short a CIRIP data set is a data set that has both uh, real labeled human uh, data, um, infant data, but only 700 that it was from Google images and YouTube videos we had to be very uh, mindful of the, the permission that we could get. And then 100 um, synthetic um, infant data. And I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit more in depth of how we were able to, to synthesize infant data. Quickly, these are the examples that you could see. These are, they were publicly available and for research purposes, we, can, we could use that and data set. Imagine we're making our own version of ImageNet, but in very much smaller. We made sure whenever we were finding, so if there were some videos that they were available, but then it was infants in one posture or one specific pose for a long time. So we weren't adding that. We wanted to have enough distribution. So here you see that the distribution of the different body uh, body parts that shows in the, in the 2D projection of that. So this is a very um, highly distributed. Interestingly, if you, you compare this distribution for human um, adult um, movement, so we don't do our hand and, and leg, they're, they're not cross each other that much, you could imagine, unless that you're doing specific physical activity, which then it's hard to find enough example of that in, in, in the pop or uh, publicly larger scale available data set. And if there are, they're going to be outliers and model, they are not gonna be uh, tuned to those rather than more general purpose movement. So, what about synthetic data? So the good thing about synthetic data generation or automatic data generation is when you are synthesizing the data and augmenting the data that you have in hand, you are also having the label data already. So this uh, since 700 data, we had to do that manually, uh, pose by pose and um, uh, body joint by body joint, make sure very accurately uh, uh, manually label Every, every single body joint. However, when we have the synthetic data, we don't have that, that problem. But then we have to make sure to, to, to generate the data as, uh, as um, re realistically as possible. So there's two approaches. One, finding some model that has been learned uh, to do by looking at some, some data and then fit that to the, to the infants. For example, if you have some template of adult model, can we fit that to the to the infant, so it's a model-based one. The other one is that looking at the, some game engine, so some already available um, model, uh, for example, an avatar of an infant and start reposing that, that model. This also allows us to expand the data set. I, I mentioned already in the inaugural event, one of the interesting aspects of having um, data synthetic synthetically generated, we can add a lot of diversity. We can add different size of the infants, different um, races, different um, uh, clothing, different backgrounds. So this allows us to expand that. So let me actually, uh, the thing that I, need, uh, I couldn't go through that, uh, I think uh, for uh, many of you would be very interesting if you could, um, uh, you, uh, you see how we can get the, this model, the template-based model work. So imagine you have an uh, initial pose and then a specific model. You want to these two match and then repose the model. So you want to find the best match. So there is an optimization problem to find the theta, the pose and beta, the, the shape that gives you the, the lowest amount of error in the matching. Then when you have this repose model, you, you look at the camera, uh, camera parameters. So you have cam camera parameters, you can change the, the angle of the camera. So then you can show your model. Remember, we have that baby in the crib from the back. So we can add all of that as part of our, our um, diversifying our, uh, our data, add background and texture. This allows us then synthetically generate a bunch of output data. Then rigging in Blender, which is a, uh, uh, a synthetic data generation engine used mostly by gamer to, to make the avatar, we can Look at some infant video that are available, extract the 3D pose from them, just estimate that because if we had the 3D pose, the problem was solved. Then look at some avatar, look at the, uh, the um, armature of that avatar, start reposing that infant based on that specific types of movement that we saw. The reason I'm saying that we have to look at some infant movement rather than randomly moving around because 
the movement happens is in a very high, especially in the pose space, it still is a high dimension. I imagine if you have 16 jo join, 16 in 3D, it's going to be 16 times three uh, dimension that you have. So it's a very high dimension. So, but the movement of infants happen on the specific types of manifold on that high dimension. So we have to, to make sure when we are generating data, our gen uh, generator knows that prior, rather otherwise it's very hard, even if you have all the um, availability of get a lot of synthetic data, but your synthetic data, they are not gonna hit the specific manifold of interest. So having that, then we can add background and, and generate the, the specific uh, poses, posture, and specific behavior that we want. Uh, this is the, the video, for example, infant falling. The good thing about this thing, capturing the specifics of infant falling is very hard. I mean, this is just, we were lucky, we were able to find that, that input data. So, and you can, we cannot ask the or push them to, to fall. So this allows us to then expand this, this fall, add a little bit of noise on top of that, still it's going to be the manifold of the fall, but then, then also help us to, if we have an inference model for infant fall detection, this we can show enough data from different infants in different sizes, different colors and different backgrounds. So let's go to the, the model. We have now this real infant data, synthetic data as part of the syrup. How we can give that to the model? They are not, I mean, it's first, uh, 1,700, it's not uh, 40,000 40, or 1.2 million. So it's not going to be enough to have, a, for example, in the ResNet 50 or, or higher um, co um, complexity model. So what uh, we have been doing, we say that let's give this data to the pose estimation model that's already trained on the, for example, COCO, uh, MS COCO data set, Microsoft COCO data set. However, we know that data is, the, the result is not good. But what we can do, we can look at the, uh, the feature that is extracted, especially lower dimensional feature that is extracted and make sure that find, try to find features that matters and get rid of the features or, or uh, reduce the effect of features that doesn't matter. The features that are coming from the specific texture of the, the background, the, uh, the specific texture of the, the image doesn't matter, but the, the features related to pose matter. So we are doing them domain confusion here to, to confuse these two features that we are extracting. And then when these two, the, we uh, close the gap between real and synthetic, we then make, uh, uh, freeze the, the domain confusion part and give this, this data again to back to the, in the iterative process to the, to the pose estimation uh, network that was on adult and we open up a few layers and then fine tune the, the network. So quickly the training for the people with the more uh, CS and engineering background. So for the initialization, we want to have a classifier that works both on the synthetic and real data. The real data, let me tell you something interesting, that 700 is, is very low that we cannot even use that for direct fine tuning. It's not gonna converge. So we needed to add the synthetic data as part of that. So on the stage one, is going to be domain uh, confusion. You see that this is um, uh, a cross entropy one. Cross entropy one is the, the idea behind that is you have two classes. One of them is real, one of them is fake. You want to make sure your, your network doesn't realize which one is that. So it's a domain confusion. So it's an adversarial uh, training part of that. On the uh, stage two, these two are confused. When uh, we are uh, trying to do pose estimation, the better, the better pose estimation, you see that based on the, the data that we have, the, the model data and the, uh, the, the ground to root, make the uh, pose estimation fine-tuned to the infant data, both real and synthetic. So let me show the, some of the uh, quantitative results. When we were applying, uh, so the, the approach that here I, I showed you, both uh, the, the part of providing some data and then also providing uh, uh, data efficient machine learning, this is somehow model agnostic. The reason is that, so you can give this to show this data to different uh, uh, very state of the art pose estimation model and then make them work better. So we wanted to first show that what has happened if we show to the state of the art model like dark pose and um, that shows um, very, uh, very high uh, to the pose, um, general purpose pose estimation. If we show them syrup, is it gonna help in infant um, uh, infant uh, um, uh, prediction. So a simple fine tuning on that shows that we, we are uh, seeing better better result 
for um, the, the test part of the, the theory. So this is a good thing. So if you show, you show them data with enough diversity, it's going to help the model to learn somehow something about the data sets that you have a small amount of that available. Not only that, we're also seeing that what, what if, if we are applying the feed, fine-tuned domain adaptation uh, approach on the model, rather than just giving the model for simple fine-tuning, we go through this uh, fine-tuning um, and uh, domain adaptation. This also showed the bump in the, in the uh, data, uh, in the uh, post-processing. Post one other thing is interesting. Remember the, the gap that we have between uh, um, adult and infant. There is also a gap, feature distribution gap between in synthetic and real data. And our FIDIP model allows us to To, to close this gap and they are getting very much confused. This was the whole idea of having that, um, that uh, domain adaptation approach, which allows the, the features, the features that matter for pose estimation to get uh, confused and get uh, distributed uh, all uh, in, the, in the same uh, distribution uh, uh, manner. So some of the result here shows that what's, what's the effect of the, the uh, R model when it's applied on the uh, not model I approach, apply on different uh, different uh, models. One thing here we, uh, we wanted to show. So dark pose is the the winner or the state of the art pose estimation, and how Philip can be uh, can uh, enhance the uh, the the performance and get rid of some of the error that uh, that we have. So dark pose by, by itself is doing very well because it has seen a lot of model and generalizability is very good. However. If we think about a specific application and the application that we have in hand, for example, application that we want to have a, a cloud-based pose estimation that is applied on every baby monitors out there. We make every baby monitor AI driven to be able to, to detect specifically the poses, understand if the babies are rolling correctly, understand if the, the babies are in their back or on their um, stomach, if they are, which we, we, have, um, we have a study that shows that can be used for them detection of sudden infant uh, death sy syndrome. Uh, so this, is, this has to be somehow, the model has to be deployable in an embedded system or on the cloud. So we were actually also looking at the other methods. So simple ba baseline or um, post mobile net, they are simpler version of the, the post estimation model that they can be implemented on a mobile device. Did the model uh, to start with is not going to have um, the, as high of a performance as dark pose, for example, the state of the art in the field. However, it's much faster, it's in, uh, in, order of, in an order of ma magnitude faster. And when we are applying the, the FIP model, still we see very um, uh, enhancement in the, in the performance. So it shows that we can actually work also, not only the, the problem of a small data here is solved, but also this allows us to, to work with the wider range of models here. And then here is the, the comparison that we had with the state of the art, uh, open pose, as well as uh, our Philip model, when it's applied for the uh, it's not infant in the crib, but uh, infants, um, the it's a nine uh, month old when cruising and going above a step. It's very uh, important uh, this to, to show how the model is much more robust, can, can track different body parts. Imagine uh, to, for detection of the the fall, detection of the specific activities, even the way that they are cruising is very important. And also one other thing that um, is, is, is part of my recently awarded uh, National Science Foundation uh, career grant is understanding the symmetry of their behavior and, uh, and movement, which is, is a hallmark for, for many of the developmental disorder in future. So the takeaway message, I was thinking about what should, should I say? Should I talk about the, the pose estimation, infant, um, the effect of that uh, on, the, uh, on the infant uh, behavioral studies and a lot of other, but I thought that let's actually uh, talk about the, the small data, especially based on the, all of the questions that I received after the inaugural event. So the, we, we are hearing that, that we are living in the, in the world that, uh, that is collecting uh, data continuously. You have mobile devices, cameras everywhere, wireless sensor networks is everywhere. So we are, uh, we are 
mm, we are in the uh, big data era. I, I, I agree because of this amount of data. And then, as I mentioned, I call big data the problem that uh, classical data processing or machine learning approach cannot, um, they're insufficient for that. But sometimes the, our problem is not that we have a lot of data available. The problem is that now we have this complex model that they are very much, um, very much powerful. And we want to bring it to, to the specific application that we don't have enough data. We have, we are suffering from the data shortage. So those advanced uh, machine learning algorithm, now they are uh, not working because data is insufficient. And this is called a small data. So for big data, I call that when our techniques are insufficient for the, for a small data when our, our data is behind our technique. So I think it's back and forth. We could see that how the small data problem also, we can call our error also a small data error. And, and the, the thing is happened is uh, the, the amount of training that we need for, for the, the model is also not only allows us the model even converge, but sometimes if it's too little, we make our model um, too complex, then we are getting overfitted. So we are gonna have the cares of the dimensionality. If and there is no generalization is happening, would happen. But if the, uh, the model then is too, too simple, we cannot have very interesting and uh, very, uh, very advanced uh, detection. So at the end, what is what we need to do? Um, here I said that rather than being a scientist, like a terrible scientist, but a great engineer, we have to cheat. So what, how I was doing that, I was looking at the pre-existing model and the data in the adjacent domain, adjacent domain, adult domain, adjacent domain, the synthetic data, the game engine. So I start to expand in the data and also looking to, to see if we can make our model simple enough to work with the, with the available uh, data. These two together, so then we don't uh, get rid of the, all of the advancement that we are making in the argument, all of these very interesting models that they can work very nicely. But on the other hand, then we, we don't need to go and collect all of the data and sit somewhere and, and collect all of that. We need a little bit of data, but then we can expand on top of that by bringing domain knowledge into the picture. So uh, I would like here to thank every single um, uh, of my students from uh, my senior scientist, postdoc, PhD student, master student, even high schooler that um, they have been uh, part of the lab uh, for their hard work and enthusiasm to solve the problem in the scientific way and in a way that is also practical. I would also like to thank uh, Nortisen EAI uh, uh, for, for supporting me um, throughout my, my career and also National Science Foundation, um, Department of Defense, for the, um, uh, for the government uh, funding to do this research and as well as different industry uh, that they have been helping me to, to solve pieces of these, uh, these small data problems. Thank you. So, so thank you, Sarah, a, a great presentation. So, um... Yeah, I just wanted to 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 finish uh, soon enough so we get a chance to to discuss some of these ideas. Yeah, so there was one on offline question. Maybe we can start with that one. So Go ahead. One second. So, so the question is uh, best practices for assessment of dataset quality and our signal learning potential. Hmm, that's a... a more generic question. Yeah. Um, so on the data quality, some of the, the thing, yeah, so if you want to understand the data quality, for me, at least, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are other, uh, other uh, people, they have different practices. For me, I, I, I look at the distribution of the data. If the data is not diverse enough, unless that we are using that for a specific uh, application, and we are not thinking about that the model is trained on data, that data is used, uh, can be used for other cases, that's the uh, that's a problem. And let me tell you, I mean, I don't know who, who was uh, asking this question. Uh, the uh, if you have a specific problem, for example, you said that okay, I have infant data problem. My infant is going to be on the crib, and uh, so a specific camera angle. So let's have that data, collect enough data from that. But that data doesn't have the diversity outside of that. And trust me. If you change a little bit of camera, the next year camera resolution is going to be different. 
the parents put the camera differently, then the model is not going to work. So I think the, to, to see the effectiveness of the data set, you have to look at the diversity that data set provides for, for your problem of interest. So you have to come up, think about what type of uh, data you may see in future or the model may see in the future and make sure that diversity is embedded as part of the, as part of the data. What was the second part of the problem? Yeah, the second problem is, is, is uh, basically assessment of signal learning potential from the data. So, so even the data could be a very good quality, uh -huh. uh, uh, maybe it's not good for learning, for example. Um, so, so. I have a mixed feeling about this. Actually, it says, uh, I believe before deep learning, before this, new era of that, most of the intelligence was in the uh, in the algorithm. So even if you look at that for object detection, simple object detection for them, uh, for the, the grand challenge of object detection, which ImageNet started with that. Before 2013, that AlexNet came from the, uh, from uh, um, Montreal, we had, oh, everything was complex on the model part. So we had, the, uh, support vector machine, different kernel of that. The last year before the deep learning, we had the ensemble of different classifier. But after deep learning, this was about the data. So you have this, I call it actually simpler, but complex in terms of the structure of the number of parameters, but simpler in, in terms of the, uh, the math behind them, back to back that needed data. So if you have good data, I, I, I can say that you can, uh, Find a model that that can can uh, um, optimize the inference that you are looking for. They are, I'm sure, there are there are um, a lot of debate about that. But I am very much advocate on the good data, and you have the good data that has enough diversity. Example that you want is especially in the deep learning one because they are. I, I know everybody says, oh, they are black boxes. We don't know what's happening. But Ricardo. To be honest, they are a, a function estimators. They are fans of what we call them, but they are a nonlinear function estimator. A bunch of linear model that you put, convolution, for example, if you're there, and then you add some nonlinear, very simple value, just a simple nonlinear to you add it in the zero, and then they can do the function. So they are function estimators. So if you have a good amount of data, you can have a function estimator. A statistics 100 years ago was telling us the same thing. Yeah, so, so, so I guess. Like, uh... Yeah, so maybe reinterpreting what you said is, is that one aspect of quality is diversity, and that will pr provide enough, enough signal to, to learn, and sometimes we don't check that. Uh, but I agree with you, if you have enough diversity, basically you have enough coverage of the problem, you, you will be okay. So the second question is, is, have you tried training a model on older children, and do you think a model could extract insights from the difference between adults and, and teenagers to extend predictive, predictive, predictive capabilities to infants? So basically, can we do some transfer learning yeah. from teenagers and people to infants? Uh, very, very good question. So actually, I did. I haven't done teenager. I, I, I don't know. I, I believe that they are very much closer to adults because we see that to teenager. But I have done on children. Imagine children, when I call that between... Uh, three to uh, seven years old. For, we did a study with a, a, a medical imaging company that they were looking at the, the autism, early onset of autism or on, uh, also autism behavior, abnormal behavior detection. For that one, we are also, we applied the, uh, the state of the art uh, pose estimation model on that. And very interestingly, when there were several adults in the picture, because it was from the home of those, those, um, those children, uh, Sometimes model thought the children was in the background because the, the way that they, the types of movement that they were doing, I mean, they imagine, especially they were uh, children on the spectrum, a low functioning uh, one, that they have a specific movement that you don't see, abnormal movement that you do, don't see. So even for that one, we had to do some fine tuning. But interestingly, we didn't need to have, I think I believe that we had only 500 sample and then it, it worked for a simple fine tuning. I haven't done, it's very interesting. I haven't done from that model to infants. I have gone, go back to the, to the adult model, but that's interesting to see that if the, the, the gap is, um, is um, less. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. I, I'm a teenager, I 
I don't think uh, we are going to have that problem because think about it, where the problem comes from. For infants, is that they have they have a huge head and they have different um, uh, muscle to um, to bone ratio and the types of movement. But as you get older, unless that there are specific types of activity, for for example, you are doing. For example, if you are in the bed, completely your your uh, movement profile is different. So then you need another model, another approach to address that. But um, it's very interesting. I haven't done from children to, to infant. So I have done adult to, inf to infants, adult to children, but yeah, maybe I, I can, I mean, I have, I think some students here. So this can be another project to see if the, the gap is uh, larger yeah, so, or smaller. So, so, uh, a good research idea from the question. <laughs> So this, uh, the next question is a long one. It's a, first has a disclaimer. So it's a, the person from the Department of Defense. <laughs> so, so he says, uh, Michael, for weapon system reliability modeling, such as missile systems, there is extremely little data available and typically in the form on, of relational tables. Therefore, transfer learning is not quite applicable and synthetic data generation requires developing really advanced physics-based models, which may still not account for factors such as environment, the weather, I guess, and so on. Furthermore, to test generate real data is expensive and there are many privacy concerns. Therefore, the domain is much more restricted than a computer vision domain. Have you done any research on machine learning for small bit data domains that cannot generate synthetic data or performance transfer learning, especially when these type of data sets are highly noisy and imbalanced on labels? Very, very good question. I have actually, mm -hmm. at the moment, I have a uh, two army project that they are dealing with the with the uh, with the problem and also hopefully I'm gonna hear back so, something from Air Force so disclaimer I don't know so for another project um, it is very interesting so when you are um, they are the amount of data is very less and it's not a big uh, uh, camera that you can go and, and uh, collect your data especially on the on the very active camps you cannot have that even if you want to do simple object detection the objects that we don't um, we don't know or the, the area is very, uh, very restricted. So when we are talking about the synthetic data generation, don't always think that we, we need to have a very realistic synthetic data generation. Here we show that because they were available. Sometimes this generative model, you don't need to have the, uh, the actually uh, vision output that is very plausible to eyes. We can have synthetic fMRI generation. So look at the generative model that generate that data. So if you know something about the model the, or the types of data that you have, some, because of that, you have to, if you say you, you have, if you have nothing, so then we have nothing. So, but if you know types of data that you can, for example, uh, for the fMRI, we were looking at some of the, the data that is available. We were looking at the, the, uh, the underlying manifold of that. We are trying to learn and I started to, to use that as a prior to generate, synthesize, fMRI data, maybe by eyes, it didn't uh, make sense. Sometimes also, if you have very small amount of data, especially on, on uh, label, so one thing that we can do, we can do this unsupervised end-to-end -end learning. And uh, for example, imagine applying a variational uh, um, autoencoder, which means that we, you give whatever data that you have to this variation, it just go to uh, some low dimensional um, uh, manifold, or it's not manifold, it's embedding because it, uh, manifold comes if they are actually, they have some linearity as, as part of that. They go to the uh, uh, low dimensional um, embedding, and then you can use that low dimensional embedding as, as part of your generative model. And then expand the data, add a little bit of noise to expand your data. And the, the types of noise, you may say that, okay, now I have that, what types of noise do you want? This actually happened, and this problem with, with the, in the collaboration with physics department, we had a very a small amount of samples from the uh, uh, a series of uh, sensors used to, to detect color, monochromatic color. But the data collection was very hard, we couldn't, this was expensive. And during COVID, then we didn't have access to the lab. So they were looking at that, what is the, the, the generative models of that? And they started adding some noise. They, they, they are physicists. They knew what types of noise is as part of the problem. And then they expanded the data set. So we learned, we then, we trained the model on that. We had to do some domain adaptation, unsupervised domain adaptation between this data and, and the other data, which was very little data. And then we, this huge amount of synthetic data. And then 
We use that to train another model applied it on the unseen data and it was working very well. So it is a hard problem. If you don't have anything, so no, we cannot solve that. But if you have something, some domain knowledge, something about the, the generation behind that, you know the shape of data that may be coming from. And then some, sometimes it has to be trial and error. You, you, dif, you apply different distributions, some work, some not. So it is, um, don't look at the synthetic data. It's only some plausible, nice uh, video that I'm showing. I am in the field of, uh, but you can, Generate e. Actually, I have collaborated there synthesizing synthesizing EEG data by looking at the, what is the uh, what is the underlying model to generate EEG data, and it's very much unknown. But they were looking at different problems, look at the physics and biology of problem, and coming up it may be wrong, but they were based on the inference that they then they apply on the real data, which they could show the performance of the data that they were generating. So, so I can complement your answer based on my own experience. Uh, uh, because I have worked in two very small data problems, so they are basically relational data. One is prediction of dyslexia, another one is a prediction of intervention uh, techniques in MLS. Uh, so they are like, typically you have only a few hundred people, because it's very hard to get oh, I see. Uh, to, to get data from that kind of people. And, and I think uh, also reinforces uh, your answer to the previous, the previous question is that if you use the right model, you can you can obtain some interesting information from those from those uh, data points, and and although it's not perfect, but you get like maybe between 70, 80 percent prediction, which for for a few hundred data points, that's, uh, I think it's, it's a lot. So you can do it, but you need to change your the technique that you are using. So this is what is very important. I I fully agree. I think that's a that's a very uh, good point. One other thing is that when it comes especially to the healthcare domain. The patient data, if you have a lot of data, patient data, your outliers, as you have. So, so when we go, so, so imagine we are from healthy adults, then uh, healthy children, sick, um, uh, sick children, sick infants. So this is from uh, left to right, right to left here on the slide. <laughs> so you are starting the data, uh, uh, the, some bottleneck on the data. So what can we do with a model that uses the understanding of that? So the model has to be able to, to use this, uh, this uh, abandoned update data on the, on the adjacent domain. So this learning, so these um, methods that we were using on uh, doing the domain confusion, try to confuse the, the model on learning the difference, rather than learning the differences, try to find the, uh, the features that matter for the inference that we have, for example, the feature for, for them, uh, for the pose estimation. Imagine the same approach, if I wanted to do, I didn't care about pose estimation, I wanted to do body texture or, or uh, clothing texture estimation. If, if the confusion has, has to be on the different part and the, uh, my model wouldn't have a pose estimation, it's going to be texture detection. So, but we have to see what features matter in the lower dimension to be able to then uh, make the, 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 the gap smaller and smaller. Hopefully then uh, we make use of the synthetic generative data. Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, one of the main problems is uh, what the person said, is, is uh, the basically in unbalanced uh, labels. And then you need to work very well on how to balance the data to, to basically make sure that you are not doing a, a trivia classifier that will, will guess that everyone has the, the, the majority label. Uh, because sometimes that happens, like in that yeah, case, it's, 90% it's percent, it will be one label, and in case of uh, MLS also, most of them will be one label, so. Exactly, yes. and it's not about only the amount of data, it's about the quality of the data yes. as well. You were talking okay, about that, agree. all of these data that is collected, a small data, so I am, I am, the concept of a small data is about the, when the data is not sufficient for the advanced machine learning, so you, you can't call it, it's a personalized data, a small, uh, um, the, um, the imbalance data, the dirty data that you cannot label, they have that, but they are all, all uh, not useful. And imbalance one, when it comes with specifically, as I said, this uh, data from healthy adult to go to ALS patient, for example, ALS patient on the specific range, it's get, uh, the amount is short. So what I'm here saying that we shouldn't toss out those those data. We yes. can learn as much as possible, but then domain adapt the stuff that we can learn from there to that. So my Philip model is trying to make use of both sides. Yeah, okay. I think I think the, the good part is there is a correlation between uh, being small and being good, because it's easier to be good when you are small. 
So the last question is, do you think any of the techniques or insights developed, developed uniquely for small data domains can be applied to help with big data problems? I'm not sure if really it's the, too much work on, on small data, which should work more on the small data. I mean, there are a lot of, has been started from 2000, uh, actually 2016 um, uh, 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 machine learning uh, conference, um, ICML, International Conference on Machine Learning, which is a flagship conference on uh, data efficient machine learning is started to, to talk about. Because as I said, every data is now a small, data. every problem is a small data problem because you need more data. You have a lot, you have one million of data. I want more to, to have accuracy of uh, 95%, 99%. So, but the, the, the stuff that we use on the small data can be used for big data. I think the, the, the pro, I think the, uh, the, uh, uh, the boundary is somehow convoluted here. As I said, you may be very quickly, you may be in the big data domain and then go to the small data domain. The big data, you start, you have lots of data, your machine learning doesn't, cannot, it's insufficient to address them. Then you make your model more complex. It works that then the model needs more data. So yes, this is in the process. It's iteratively, we are going, you have a small, you have a small data, you have big data, make your model better, then you are a small data. The, the, the model, then you have to, uh, then the data, more data is available, then you get big data, a small data. So yes, I think the learning are very much uh, transformative between the small data and, and big data domain. It's about the, the complexity of the, the model, the complexity of the model that you're using, the amount of data that you have. Well, so thank you, Sarah, for a, a great presentation and, and a great Q&A. And, and as we put in the chat, we invite all of you to come back on April 27th for our next distinguished lecture. That is Oren Sioni, the CEO of the Allen Institute for AI that will talk about NLP, wow. uh, Semantic Scholar, and, and how to fight COVID-19. So thank you for coming and see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.